Okay, uh, my name is Dean Fetterman. I'm a consultant radiologist with uh, MDI Radiology uh, with a specialty in MRI, and I'll be talking today on uh, spinal MRI. So just some basics on MRI, uh, the, the key differences between other modalities. MRI obviously provides superior contrast resolution compared with other imaging. And the key difference is that it differentiates between different tissue types better than all other modalities and provides better image detail and more information. We rely on multi-sequences, T1, T2 predominantly, and this provides more useful information. And by manipulating various sequences such as fat saturation, uh, flare sequences or removing water, uh, again we can provide more problem solving techniques. We use multi-planar uh, multi imaging and one of the big things in modern day is the absence of uh, any radiation exposure. So it's pretty important to understand the contraindications to MRI. Uh, the absolute contraindications are pacemakers, apart from a new pacemaker that's only come out in the last year or two. Uh, cochlear implants, again there's only a certain period of cochlear implants that are contraindicated and if there's any concern uh, we should always do CT of the petrous temporal bones, look to see if there's any metalware within the ears. And again, certain aneurysm clips. And at our institution, we require uh, formal documentation of any aneurysm clips before the patient undergoes MRI. And end stage renal failure. So, if, pretty much if patients have an EGFR less, less than 30, uh, patients do not receive any contrast. So, obviously, for non contrast studies, there's no uh, renal failure doesn't apply. And between EG, uh, EGFR of 30 and 60, you'd always want to consult the patient and obviously consent them if they were to receive any contrast. Um, the relative contraindications are quite long. Um, most of these are not of significance. Some of the things are early post-operative period, for instance. We don't like if someone's had a cardiac stent. Um, you like to wait at least six weeks until the, the stent's been uh, integrated into the vessel before you undergo MRI in case there's any micro vibration that might bring it loose. But most of these, as I say, are relative contraindications and if there's any doubt, there are abundance of references that uh, we look at to see if there's any real reason we should be doing the scan. If worse comes to worse, we just delay the scan until the safe period. So just an overview of the sequences. Well, T1 is T1 and T2, as I said, are the main sequences used. T1 the way to remember it is water is black. And the beauty of T1 is it provides really good anatomical detail. It shows, especially in spinal imaging, you see the bone marrow, uh, you see the trabecular markings very well, you see uh, muscles really well. So it's excellent for looking at normal anatomy. The problem is it's not very good for looking at abnormal pathology um, because water is black and most pathology produces water and we use that to help highlight pathology. So T1 is really our uh, anatomical scan. T2, this is the one that we use uh, predominantly for looking for pathology and the way to remember it is uh, World War II, water is white on T2. In spinal imaging as I said this is the most useful and it's e easily differentiated for T1 because as I said CSF is white um, so it stands out on all sequences by showing up the uh, spinal cord and everything else very nicely. And as, as mentioned, almost all pathology produces edema, and this shows up as bright signal on T2. Unfortunately, fat is also bright on T2, uh, including fatty bone marrow. And so one of the most important sequences we use is what we call a fat saturation technique. And by removing all the fat in the uh, around the patient, so it's the fat in the soft tissues, fat in the bone marrow, all that you're left with is water. And therefore, you're left with pretty much just CSF and any water elsewhere for instance in the bone or in the soft tissues uh, that's pathological will be easily show up and we'll see, have a look at some cases later. So another sequence that's, that's used quite a lot, less so in, in uh, spinal imaging, is proton density scanning. Proton density scanning is excellent in that it both has T1 and T2 qualities. So it provides really good anatomical detail but like T2 the water is white. So it allows the best of both worlds. And this is used, this is the predominant sequence used in musculoskeletal imaging, but really doesn't have much of a role in, uh, in spinal imaging. So, just as a contrast agent, the most commonly used agent is Magnavist. 
And unlike C CT, it's really important to know that there's no iodine in MRI contrast agents, uh, and therefore patients who have an iodine allergy um, can undergo contrast-enhanced MRI without any uh, ill side effects. It's a very well-tolerated uh, contrast agent with almost no side effects. Um, all, all, almost all contrast scanning is performed with the T1 fat saturation. And again, by removing all the fat which is bright, when you give contrast, anything that's bright is theoretically going to be enhancing. And we'll show some cases later. It's very good in spinal imaging, for instance, when we're looking for postoperative perineural scar, uh, when we've got bone lesions or soft tissue lesions, more, more than bone lesions. Um, and it provides uh, really useful information. Just as a rough rule, uh, contrast is only really used in about, uh, in about 1 in 15 to 1 in 20 patients. Um, and it's commonly used in the postoperative back. So just some examples. You can see clearly uh, the T2 scan. We can see water is white, and as mentioned, therefore CSF is very well uh, uh, shows up very well. And you can see all the spinal nerve root, quarter equina, everything highlights really nicely. But as mentioned, also fat is also bright. So it's just uh, you know we use the fat saturation technique to obviously remove the fat, and then all we're left with is water. If you have a look at the T1 sequence, you can see it's quite clearly this is T1, CSF is black, and as a result, you don't see the detail of the nerve roots, spinal cord, anywhere near as well. Also, if you have a look at the discs, the discs, which are primarily made up of water till they become desiccated, um, they all look grey and black, and so when you compare it to the T2, you get a better assessment of what the discs are like on the T2 sequence, because again, you're able to see the water within the disc, and those that are dehydrated become black. So, a very good way of just looking at all the sequences, and I have, obviously this this is not the spine, but it's a very good way of looking at the subtle differences between the sequences. You can see T1 again. You can see the nice trabecular markings, and you see these on the, in the spine as well. But you can see the joint fluid is black, and you compare it to T2. Joint fluid out the back here is bright. Your trabecular markings aren't as well seen. Um, and so, the, you know, it's quite subtle, the differences between T1 and T2. If we move across to proton density, as I said, you're seeing bony detail quite well. Water is white or bright. So again, it's a combination of the T1 and T2. And the sequence that is most commonly used to look at pathology is the T2 or PD fat saturation sequence. By removing all the fat, everything becomes black, the bone marrow, the fatty tissue all becomes black, and all we're left with is water. And as we can see on this, this is the easiest scan to have a look for joint fluid. And again, pathology will show up most easily on the T2 fat saturation sequence. So just that was a bit of a general overview of MRI. Now we'll just go into some more detail on spinal MRI in particular. Spinal MRI. It's obviously the most accurate and sensitive means of visualising the spinal cord, nerve roots, looking at central canal lesions, and also assessing the paraspinal soft tissues. So what are the main indications or reasons that we do MRI of the spine? Well, obviously looking at causes for local spinal pain, as well as clearly ridiculous type symptoms, unexplained pain in the shoulder, hip pain, uh, symptoms down to the lower limbs. Of course, if patients develop uh, limb weakness or sensory changes, some would say that you know we should be bypassing CT of the lumbar spine, but obviously going straight to spinal MRI because we do show the uh, neurology a lot better. And as well, at the same time, we're looking at the spinal cord for any uh, spinal cord pathology that may be accounting for the patient symptoms, which we clearly don't see on CT. In the post-operative back, we're looking at post-surgical scar, which is again much better visualised with MRI. It's very good in, look, in surgical planning and treatment, and therefore, really, before any spinal or most spinal surgery is performed, an MRI will usually be uh, indicated preoperatively. And in the trauma setting, it's an excellent modality for looking at not only the bony injuries but disc and ligamentous injuries. So this is just a, an easy sort of a, uh, way of appreciating the differences between the different modalities. So we can see a normal lumbar spine X-ray. You see the bone very well, and X-ray and CT are excellent modalities at looking at calcification and bony structures. So you can see the bony detail very well on, on CT and on X-ray. But as you can appreciate, there's not much in the way of soft tissue detail. 
We compare the x-ray, and this is a patient with lower limb radicular symptoms. All the discites look no relatively normal. There's no bony pathology. We then move on to a CT. Now, on the CT, you get the vague impression that there's a bit of a disc fragment at the back here. But again, because the soft tissues are not well visualised, the disc fragment isn't well highlighted relative to the spinal canal and other tissues. But we do get the impression that we can see that there's a disc fragment there, although subtle. Compare this to a sagittal T2 MRI, not only do we see that there's a disc fragment, but we can actually see there's separation between the disc and the disc fragment. And we can clearly say that this is a sequestered disc fragment rather than extruded disc fragment, which would stay communicating with the parent disc. Just some important anatomy, which helps obviously when we're going through our spinal, uh, spinal MRIs. There are three joints we look at. We look at the vertebral bodies, the discs. We look at the unconvertible joints in the cervical spine, posterior laterally, and they very, play a very important role in neural impingement um, and foraminal stenosis in the cervical region, and obviously facet joints. And again, throughout the spine, they play an important role in, uh, in neural foraminal stenosis. Neural structures, well, obviously we, we look at the cord. On every lumbar spine MRI, we look at the, where, where the conus is terminating which should be around the T12 L1 level in an adult. We look at the cord equina. Is it normal? Are the nerve roots flowing freely or are they clumped or is there arachnoiditis or is there other pathologies such as lesions on the cord equina? So we look at all these as stock standard and we, generally we make comment on the cord, conus and cord equina on all lumbar spine and uh, imaging and obviously assessing the cord on all the uh, thoracic and cervical imaging. And just some key terminology, because there is much confusion as to how people report. And I think this is, it's really important that people try and understand the differences in terminology. We should be referring to all nerves that are leaving the spinal cord and, ex and exiting a neural frame at a level as the exiting nerve root. And any nerve that's coming, it might be coming out of the cord, but it's descending to exit at a lower level, the descending nerve root. It's pretty straightforward. It's very clear. And, and obviously, when you're, when you're using this terminology, the referral or the person reading the uh, report gets an understanding of which nerve is being affected. The discs. Well, there's really two structures, the nucleus pulposus, which is a high T2 signal um, because it's water, obviously when in a normal disc. And with time, that will dehydrate. You lose its water content. And as I showed previously, the disc gradually becomes lower in signal on T2. And then there's the annulus, which is a low T2 signal rim. And we see both these structures very very well on T2. On, um, T2 imaging, and they should be looked at on every on every scan. Obviously, the annulus, when it's intact, is a nice low signal rim, but we look predominantly for annular fissures or tears, and uh, subsequently any extruded disc that might be coming out from the uh, annular tears. So, as I mentioned, discs with time they lose their water content, they become desiccated, and this means they prog progressively become black on T2. They subsequently lose height and they may or may not develop annular tears or fissures. And these are described as either being partial or full thickness. They're usually in the posterior discs, and they're most commonly at the L4-5 and L5-S1 level. And we see them as a horizontal high signal line at the back of the disc. What's their relevance? Well, we see them very commonly on spinal imaging. But the key thing to note is that in the acute setting, if they do tear, they are a potential painful stimulus. And we know that these only last, or the painful stimulus usually only lasts several weeks. So if we see nothing much on a spinal MR, someone comes in with a quite a bright annular fissure, you know, we, we know that that's a potential painful stimulus. And, we, you know, I would comment there is a annular fissure or annular tear at a certain disc level. And in the acute setting, this is a potential cause for the patient's uh, lower, lower back pain. So just some uh, images to highlight this. So here we can see this is what we'd normally see as an annular fissure, bright signal, the back of the disc. The annulus is still intact posteriorly, so this is a partial thickness annular fissure or annular tear. And this is on the post-contrast study. We can see the, uh, the fissure or, or tear is, uh, is um, enhancing. And, you know, this may be, in this particular instance, this was quite an acute presentation. But you can see the posterior margin of the disc is still normal. There's no extruded or... A disc fragment or disc bulge at this level. T2 
terminology of the disks. Well, a few years back, official documentation came out to say this is the terminology that should be used when we're describing disks. Unfortunately, not everyone uh, has adopted this, uh, but this is the this is the official guidelines of how we should be referring to our disks when we discuss them. It is a little bit confusing, but there are a couple of uh, basic rules that we need to apply. The key thing is that for something to be abnormal, the disk needs to extend at least two millimeters beyond the end plate. So it's not uncommon that we see a little bit of sort of what looks like a bulge at the back of the disk, but it's only one or two millimeters. That's within normal limits. If we think of the disk as a as a circle and divide it into quadrants, this is the way they've, that we that we use to describe disks. And basically, we look at is it a large disk that's involving, say, more than 180 degrees of the disk, or is it a focal area of disk pathology? And by by dividing into these quadrants, we can come up with the, um, the terminology. So, in a generalized disk bulge. Uh, is basically a bulge that occupies more than 180% of the disk. And so the word bulge in itself just means it's a, a large area of the disk that's involved. Um, sometimes it's difficult to exactly know whether it's a bulge or a, a large, broad disk protrusion. But in essence, if you hear the word bulge, you know it's a broad disk. It doesn't mean it's large in size, it just means it's, it's involving more than 180 degrees of the disk. If it's less than 180 degrees, there are multiple different terminologies that we use. Protrusion is the most common thing we see, and the protrusion divide into two. There's either a broad-based disc protrusion, which involves 25 to 50% of the disc, or focal disc protrusion, which is less than 25%. So if it's only involving a small quadrant, focal disc protrusion. Extrusion and, and focal disc protrusions are often difficult to uh, differentiate. The key thing with extrusion is that the height, or the AP dimension, is greater than the width of the disc fragment. And more often than not, the extrusions are more acute. So a bit of the nucleus pulposus has herniated or, or extruded through the annulus, and you're getting a more round or a, a larger bit of disc with a narrow uh, base at its parent disc. And as I said, these are uh, commonly uh, more acute in their, in their presentation. And sequestered disc fragment, as I showed you earlier, is one where it's actually progressed from an extrusion and it's actually separated from the parent disc. And these, once it's separated, it can then move either proximal migration or distally, and therefore can uh, end up in various locations. So just some pictures to highlight it too, because I think it's much easier if you sort of see it uh, schematically. These are the two different sorts of protrusions. You have a broad disc protrusion, which you can see is involving 25 to 50% of the disc, and a focal disc protrusion, which is less than 25%. Here you can see the progression from a protrusion, which is just out the back. It's got quite a broad base, but narrow in its uh, superior and AP dimension. An extruded disc where it's progressed. The neck is, this time it's the opposite. The neck is narrow, but the disc is largest in its craniocaudal dimension. And sequestered is when this fragment then detaches. And as mentioned, once it detaches, it can, more often than not, uh, it uh, descends or undergoes what we call inferior subligamentous spread. It stays deep to the ligament and goes uh, inferiorly. Occasionally they can demonstrate superior subligamentous spread, so they can go superiorly, but obviously due to gravity, inferior is more common. This is my approach to um, reading spinal MRI. Everyone takes on a fairly, fairly similar sort of approach, but I've broken it down to different areas just to get an appreciation of the sort of things that we look at. Obviously, we look at spinal alignment. We're looking at both the sagittal and the coronal plane, looking for any scoliosis or spondylolisthesis. Now, when we're looking at the bone, the key differentiation between MRI and other modalities such as CT and, and X-ray is that we're look, we, we get to see the bone marrow and the qualities of the bone marrow. So it's really important that you say, is it normal bone marrow for the patient's age? Have they got patchy marrow? That's usually what we see with advancing age. Or is there marrow infiltrations? So has the fat in the marrow started to get replaced by something? And then obviously we're looking for cord lesions and fractures. And we look at the pedicles. So in the lumbar spine, if the patient has congenitally short pedicles, they have developmental narrowing of their spinal canal, and therefore it won't take much of a disc to create symptoms. We look at the spinal cord. So we look at 
for the cord signal and obviously if, are there any cord lesions. The most common things we see are high signal within the cord. And then it's a matter of deciding, is the high signal from myelomalacia? Is it from cord edema? And with cord edema, the cord volume is either normal or sometimes expanded. Or are there any cord lesions, such as demyelinating plaques or, or tumours? We look at the conus. Is it terminating appropriately at T12L1? Or are there, or are there any reasons that uh, the conus may not be terminating pro uh, appropriately? And similarly, we look for any cord lesions of the conus. And lastly, we look at the cord equina. Again, looking for lesions, and one of the most common things we see is arachnoiditis. Then we go through each disc level, and at each disc level we look at various facets. First thing we look at is obviously the disc. Is it a normal looking disc? Is it dehydrated? Or is there any disc pathology? Moving on to the facets, is there any facet degeneration? And with facet degeneration, have they developed synovial cysts, which can contribute to foraminal stenosis and neural impingement? We look at all the ligaments, and this is predominantly, the, the ligaments play a, a big role in when, when there is associated facet degeneration, in that the ligament of uh, ligamentum flavum becomes hypertrophic and sometimes play a really important uh, role in canal stenosis. And obviously we look at ligaments in the setting of trauma, has there been any ligament disruption? When we're looking at the central canal, we look at the level of stenosis and which nerves are being impinged. Are the nerves being contacted? And if they are being contacted, is the nerve itself thickened? And if the nerve itself is thickened, that's obviously a good indication that it's the cause of the patient's pain and there's inflammation associated with the nerve. We look at the neural foramen, again, looking for any neural impingement. And we, lastly, we look at the paraspinal soft tissues and muscles. Uh, is there any paraspinal edema? Is there, is there any uh, paraspinal muscle atrophy? So the way I'm going to do it, I'm just going to run through some cases that highlight some of the important things that we see in spinal imaging, just as an easy way to sort of, I guess, cover various things you might encounter in when you're looking through your MRIs. So the first thing is, when history counts, Here we're looking at a patient with uh, central canal stenosis. In the sagittal image we get appreciation straight away that there's some canal narrowing, the cervical region, there's some disc narrowing. And we have a look. Now the key thing is, even though there's some canal narrowing, the symptoms are not from the canal stenosis. It's really imp important that we look obviously in the axial plane. And here we can see what you call an unconvertible disc ossiophyte complex. So there's degeneration of the unconvertible joint, which I said previously plays a really important role in cervical imaging and canal stenosis. The facet itself looks normal. So this patient's got neural foraminal stenosis with impingement of the nerve at it, as it's exiting at that level. Primarily produced from unconvertible disc degenerative change. And you can see on the other side, you can actually see the nerve rootlets being uh, exiting without any impingement. So in this particular instance, even though there's canal stenosis, that's not where the symptoms are coming from. The symptoms are coming from the exiting foramen. And clearly, the patient has neurology in this distribution. We know that that's where the symptoms are. Just as the last one, I'll just, I'll just go back and highlight something as well in the last one. If you, if you have a look, you can actually see the vertebral arches very well on, on cervical imaging. So it's this uh, flow void, because it's fast flow, it comes up as black. I'll often make comment, especially in the cervical spine, where the uh, vertebral artery is in relation to the nerve. If it's taking a tortuous course and traversing the neural foramen, sometimes the artery exits at a higher level than normal, or it may exit, then re-enter the, the uh, cervical canal. I'll often make comment, because it's really important, if I was to come and put an, a, a needle in and do a nerve block, it's really important that obviously we know where the uh, vertebral artery is in relation to the nerve root. So, as a, uh, as a general rule, when I'm reporting any, uh, any neural foraminal stenosis, if there is any vertebral arch, if the vertebral artery is in any way not where it should be, I'll always make comment and always make reference to that in my conclusions. So it's just important that you guys uh, have an appreciation of where the uh, vertebral artery is as well. The next case, the patient's symptoms just don't add up. This is a patient that underwent two, a young patient, two cervical spine CTs for bilateral upper limb radiculopathy. The patient was reassured, nothing was on, symptoms disappeared, they came back. And as we can see on this particular case, the patient has a focal area of T2 signal hyperintensity in their cord. Although it looks like, as you can see, here's the central canal, very well detailed, 
looks like a focal expansion of the central canal. It's got a somewhat elliptical shape to it. So it's not a syrinx, because a syrinx would just be distension of the cervical canal. This is actually a demyelinating plaque. This patient had MS. Obviously, it's important to differentiate it from other causes, such as spinal tumours. This patient went on to have a, uh, an MRI of their brain, which also showed demyelinating plaques, which helped us uh, reassure us that this was also a demyelinating plaque in the cervical cord. Next case, neck pain post motor vehicle accident. Just as an overview, the sort of things that we look at, obviously, uh, in when we're reporting spinal MRI, uh, apart from the discs, the marrow, the key thing is to look for ligament disruption. Because we all know ligament disruption can be as bad, if not worse, for the patient outcome as bony pathology or disc pathology in the traumatic setting. So the key things we're looking for are the ALL, or the anterior longitudinal ligament, the PLL, or posterior longitudinal ligament, both of these supporting the discs and vertebral bodies, posteriorly the ligamentum flavum, interspinous ligaments, and looking to see is there edema within the interspinous ligament or is the interspinous space widened. And in addition, which it hasn't highlighted here, we're looking at the facet joints. So has there been any facet joint capsular disruption? And this might just show up as some edema around the facet joint or some increased fluid within the facet joint. So this is the T, a standard T2 sequence of a, a patient who's come in, acute spinal trauma, uh, motor vehicle accident. Here we can see some bright signal in the end plates of these discs with a narrow desiccated disc. These are just modic end plate degenerative changes. Again, some degenerate changes here with a Schmalz node, degenerate Schmalz node, and some more degenerate changes. Remember, this is T2, so that bright signal in the, in the vertebral bodies is from normal fatty marrow. It's very hard to see if there's any uh, edema within the uh, vertebral bodies because it's the same signal as the uh, marrow. And similarly in the soft tissues, is there any spinal edema, a paraspinal edema? Well, it's very hard to tell because fat and water are of the same signal. So our best friend in trauma imaging is our T2 fat saturation sequence. Same patient. As we can see, there's extensive soft tissue traumatic injury. White line shows clearly there's some pre-vertebral soft tissue swelling. The purple arrow shows that in these two discs here, there's some bright signal. The vertebral body should be uh, dark. The marrow is suppressed and the fat's suppressed. Here we can see some bone bruising. We can see some interspinous edema. So there's an interspinous ligament sprain. The interspinous spaces haven't widened. So this would be sprain rather than disruption. Because in disruption, they'd be widened. If we have a look further, as we're sort of panning through on the sagittal plane, we can actually see that the posterior longitudinal ligament should be running nice and straight down the back. It's actually disrupted and it's actually angled into the canal. So that's a posterior longitudinal ligament disruption. And again, ligamentum flavum is the same. It should be a, a very well demarcated black line at the posterior aspect of the cord, oh sorry, canal. And here we can see it's disrupted and it's extending into the canal. So this patient has PLL, ligamentum flavum, and interspinous ligament injury. So a high-grade, multi-level uh, soft tissue injury. Again, similar, another case, just looking at the trauma, uh, a trauma setting. This patient presented quite differently. This patient had previously had a motor vehicle accident, had undergone x-rays and CT, which showed there was no fracture, uh, no significant disc pathology, Patient presented six months later um, with lower limb weakness and uh, quite progressive and uh, a significant difficulty in walking. This patient at the time of presentation had absolutely normal spinal alignment. There were no fractures, very true. Unfortunately, the patient had an anterior longitudinal ligament disruption as well as some acute disc pathology, which was missed on the CT. Patient has subsequently, this is only six months down the track, has had a post-traumatic antro or spondylolisthesis due to their anterior longitudinal ligament disruption. And this patient subsequently underwent urgent spinal surgery. So it just highlights the importance of MRI in the trauma setting. If the CT is normal and the X-ray is normal, but the patient has midline pain or any symptoms that don't fit, they should be undergoing spinal MRI. Another case, this is again a young patient presented with severe anterior thigh pain, had had two, again, two CTs that were reported as normal. Young patient, radiated twice, 
my theory is if there's any if there's any form of um, neuropathy, obviously they should be going for MRI first, but if they've had a normal CT, there's real no grounds for repeating the CT, that they should be going straight for MRI as a second line investigation, if not the first line. And the key difference is, we can see again, the spatial resolution is the, the key uh, on this case because the patient has a tiny disc protrusion or little extrusion in the neural foramen. On CT, these are very hard to pick because this area is often masked by the bone, soft tissues, it, they all blend into one. And you can see here, there's normal fat around the right-sided exiting nerve root, and on the left, there's a tiny little disc that's contacting the exiting nerve root. This patient underwent a CT-guided uh, nerve sheath injection and was asymptomatic within a week. Osteoporotic patient with unexplained pain. This is not an uncommon presentation. And again, often these patients will end up with an X-ray or CT, and if it's normal, the patients are sent back into the community. The key thing is, if the if symptoms don't fit, they should be undergoing MRI to look, is there something else going on? And again, this is not an uncommon presentation where we see patients presenting with lumbar sacral pain, unilateral, and the, the, uh, the uh, referral usually says, is there any disc pathology or facet joint pathology? Well, not uncommonly in the osteoporotic patients, we see uh, insufficiency fractures in their sacrum. So this is a coronal fat saturation sequence of the sacrum, and we can see marrow edema down the right sacral alar with some low signal in between. This is the insufficiency fracture, and this is all the bone marrow edema or bruising around that area. And again, we routinely do a coronal fat saturation sequence through the whole lumbar spine and sacrum for this particular reason, so that we don't miss any uh, pathology that might be going at the sacral alar joints or within the sacrum that may be causing the patient's symptoms. Next case, more than just facet degeneration. This patient presents with symptoms primarily of uh, uh, neural impingement and radiculopathy, not much in the way of back pain. You can see here the patient has severe facet degeneration, worse on the left than the right, with the right side has a bit of a joint effusion, a, a facet joint effusion. The canal is narrowed due to a combination of the facet degeneration, hypertrophy of ligamentum flavum, which should be a lot thinner than this, and some disc pathology. You can see the fecal sac is quite markedly impinged. But if we go down to the next level, we can see that a large portion of the, the canal uh, stenosis is being attributed to by this cyst arising from the, from the facet joint or synovial cyst. These can sometimes be decompressed and the patients become uh, symptom, uh, asymptomatic just from uh, decompression of the synovial cyst. But it's important to comment on this because rather than having uh, more advanced spinal surgery, the patient may be able to go more minimal, uh, undergo more minimal surgery to alleviate their symptoms. And the patient's symptoms were left-sided and arising from most likely this, this area here. Disc extrusion. Sagittal T2 sequence. You can see the discs are all, you know, a little bit degenerate. Protrusions here. This is probably within normal limits. As I said, it has to be more than two millimetres beyond the posterior margin of the disc. And here we can see a bit of disc fragment that's actually extending down somewhat uh, deep to the uh, posterior longitudinal ligament. So the question is, is there the beginnings of an extruded disc fragment here? We can see again, perhaps, it looks like there is some disc developing down here, but the level above is not too dissimilar. Here it's a little bit more pronounced. And again, you get the impression as you were going, panning through on the sagittal images, there is a bit of disc fragment that's down here, and we're not seeing it at any other levels. But again, it's quite subtle. So we rely heavily on our axial sequences. This is the same level. This, the, the pathology here is on the right. We can see that this patient has a background broad-based disc protrusion. But superimposed on that is a more focal area of disc. And this is as we're going down. You can see the disc is progressively going down and down into the right lateral recess and and it's uh, compressing the descending right L5 nerve root. So this is an extruded disc fragment with inferior subligamentous spread. It's not sequestered because it's still connecting to the parent disc. And often we see that these extruded disc fragments are on the back, uh, usually or not uncommonly, on a background of a disc protrusion or a disc bulge, and then superimposed on that is a extruded disc. So it's important to differentiate the two because that broad-based disc protrusion is really not causing the patient any symptoms. Their symptoms are arising from that extruded disc fragment. 
Another case, as we mentioned earlier, you know what they say, people with small pedicles have small... Well, canals. That's what we're seeing here. Very, very, very nicely on this case, a young patient. You can see their central canal is generally very narrow compared to that of a normal person. Their pedicles are short, you can see, and they tend to develop this sort of shape to their canal because their canals are, are, are short. But you can see the patient, I mean, by all rights, in a normal person, this would almost be uh, mild central canal narrowing. You can see that it's not going to take much of a disc to narrow the canal or to cause uh, neural impingement. So it's important that you highlight this because they may have only a very small disc protrusion, but they're presenting with neurology. Postoperative back. Now this is a really important area because, again, a lot of patients undergo CTs inappropriately, get told there's no, no cause for their ongoing pain. But their perineural, uh, uh, any scar or post-surgical change is nowhere near as well highlighted on a CT as it is on an MR. The key things to note is that you can have normal perineural or epidural enhancement for up to about three months post-surgery. And this is just normal granulation tissue in the post-surgical back. Very, or not uncommonly, unfortunately, you get reports where they do say there is perineural scar in a patient that's only had surgery two months ago. Well, very often they'll come back six months' time and that's all gone. So it's important that that's thought of as granulation tissue and not scar. This is, at this point, it's really important also to note that obviously the clinical history is really important. Patients might say, oh, I had my operation about four months ago, uh, and you call it perineal scar. If it was actually two and a half months ago, it's more likely to be granulation, or maybe granulation tissue. After three months, any perineural enhancement should be thought of as post-surgical scar tissue. Um, and it's not uncommon, you know. Uh, somewhere between 10 and 15% of patients will have some form of perineural scar. In, just so you know, in, in, our, in our institution, anyone that's a post-surgical back to within five years of surgery, we give contrast. Some institutions only do three years. Um, the surgeons often like to know what's going on. And if there's no other cause and there's some perineural enhancement, they know that there's not much they can do for the patient as far as uh, surgery goes. Or Often there's not much they can do. Um, it's really important, the surgeons often really want us to know is there any scar, it gives them a roadmap or a plan as to how they're going to manage the patient. If there's no scar, obviously we've got to look for other things such as recurrent disc pathology. And this is just a good case to highlight the sort of scar tissue that we see. On the T1, you can see the n normal nerve on the left, you can see the normal fatty soft tissue planes around it, and on the right you can see this low signal around the nerve, loss of normal fatty planes, so it's ill-defined. And on the post-contrast study, this is a T1 fat saturation. As I said, we do fat saturation for all our contrast scans. And we can see all this area around that's ill-defined is enhancing, and that's post-operative perineural scar. So the next case, is there more than meets the eye? This patient presented with unexplained L5-S1 pain with an essentially normal X-ray and CT. This is the patient's uh, pelvis X-rays bit of hip degeneration, some disc end plate changes, but all in all, nothing much is going on. Not much in the way of, there's no bone lesion, there's no evidence of fractures. The patient went on to have an MRI. This is a coronal T1 sequence. Normal marrow, as I said earlier, is bright. On this particular patient, all the marrow has been replaced in the pelvis and is, is black. So this is evidence of marrow infiltration. We can see the trichant, just the tip of the greater trochanter on the right here. And this is normal fatty signal out here on the greater trochanter. A bit of normal fatty marrow signal here in the uh, pubic ramus. So there are a few little areas of normal, uh, normal marrow signal, but all in all, the marrow has been replaced and it's all dark. So this is extensive marrow replacement. The differentials for this, especially in an elderly patient, are metastasis, myeloma and lymphoma. We can't really differentiate the, between these, but we just give a differential list, but clearly the patient needs further workup. The other thing to note is that obviously red marrow reconversion is another thing. So in patients that have lost their normal fatty marrow, the benign cause for this is when they've had red marrow reconversion. And that's not uncommon to see little patches of low T1 and T2 signal in the spine. The report would usually read, 
there are focal areas in the spine that with loss of normal marrow signal. While this may represent focal areas of red marrow, diagnosis of exclusion of metastasis, myeloma, and lymphoma, the patient requires further workup. Discitis, a really important one to obviously uh, rule out in uh, anyone presenting with back pain. This is a patient presenting with uh, pain in the L5-S1 region. On the T1 sequence, we can see that there is, obviously it's T1, CSF is black. There's some end plate changes, the L5-S1 level. Now the key thing is, is this just degenerate changes? The disc doesn't look normal. Is it just uh, modic end plate degenerative changes? Well, we can't really tell on the T1 sequence. We have a look at the T2 sequence. The big and really important thing on this sequence is that the disc is bright. So high signal within the disc in a patient that has end plate degenerative changes. Now when we see end plate degenerative changes in those cases we saw before, the discs were dark. They become desiccated, they become degenerate. We can safely say that if it's a dark disc with end plate changes, that it's most likely going to be degenerate uh, disc changes. On this case, because it's bright, straight away the first thing that comes to mind is that there's some inflammatory process within the disc or discitis osteomyelitis occurring. So in this particular patient, bone marrow or the bony changes in the end plates in the setting of an inflamed disc would suggest there is discitis osteomyelitis, the adjacent end plates. Obviously if we gave contrast, T1 fat saturation with contrast, all this area would highlight the end plates that are affected were also highlighted or enhanced. Another really important one is epidural hematoma. Here we can see, a, so this is a T2 sequence of the, of the thoracic spine. We can see CSF is bright, but at the posterior aspect of the canal is a separate fluid collection which is encapsulated by a low signal rim. You can see the normal CSF here, you've got the cord CSF, and the posterior aspect of the fecal sac is this black line at the back. Well, the back line continues, but there's a separate area encapsulating a pocket of fluid. The differentials for this are obviously a epidural hematoma, um, or it could be infective in nature. This patient's had what looks like recent surgery. They've got some cord signal in their lower thoracic cord, which is presumably cord edema, or it could be myelomalacia. There is a bit of loss of volume of the cord more superiorly, so it depends on what, what the surgery was for. But the key thing here is there's an encapsulated fluid collection in the post-operative, early post-operative setting this is most likely a, he oh, a hematoma. Another case, trauma setting. This is a patient that's got very significant spinal trauma. They've ruptured their anterior longitudinal ligament with pre-vertebral pre edema. The disc is bright, so in the traumatic setting, this is most likely acute disc pathology. Their posterior longitudinal ligament is disrupted. You can see there's discontinuity at the back. Ligamentum flavum and interspinous ligaments are disrupted. You can see here the interspinous space is widened, so therefore it's clearly um, interspinous ligament disruption. But again, we have this area within the posterior canal, which is heterogeneous, it's not following the signal of CSF, and in, with such significant trauma, this is clearly going to be a, a post-traumatic hematoma. You can see also the, the key thing to note here is, have a look at the cord, it's displaced anteriorly. Again. That just that bulge or contour deformity suggests that there's something within the posterior aspect of the fecal sac at that level. Arachnoiditis. As, as I mentioned, when we look at the lumbar spine, it's really important to look at the spinal um, cauda equina. Arachnoiditis can often be very subtle. Um, it's not uncommon, especially in the post-surgical back, and um, it's really important to, to work out whether or not it's present because obviously it can be symptomatic. Normal spinal canal, we can see all the, sorry, normal cauda equina, we can see all the individual nerve roots sitting nicely, the posterior aspect of the canal. We can see the exiting nerve roots have already left and they're about to leave, go out through the neural foramen. But all the nerves are just sort of sitting dependently at the posterior aspect of the canal. This is the same patient at another level. We can see they've had a previous laminectomy, some degenerate changes in the facets, and here we can see the cauda equinas all clumped. Larger area on the left, two small areas on the right. So this is the clumped type of arachnoiditis. And, and there are various types of arachnoiditis, but this is, this is the clumped type. And on this particular occasion, the patient was not symptomatic of their, um, of their arachnoiditis, but clearly it can be uh, symptomatic. 
So that's an overview of spinal MRI. Hopefully you've learned something um, and uh, hope you enjoyed the lecture. Thank you.